70%. But now let's get legal perspective as we have Barrister Clifford Thomas join us in our studio this morning. Good to see you, sir. A very good morning to you. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Peace. Good morning. Peace. Uh, it's nice to be here on set this morning. Um, it's, it's a refreshing outlook, uh, given the fact that um, Nigeria is going to has just entered a new phase. And that new phase is a phase where local governments will be held accountable and responsible for every dime that comes to that local government. Uh, nobody will want to hide under the state government, say the state government collected so much from me. But um, to whom much is given, much is expected. Uh, but do we have the capacity and the sagacity to actually start doing that? They have been desiring to have it all along. Now you have this gift, you can't use it, but let's see whether we have the capacity to use it. Now, whilst the capacity is a big question, another question many Nigerians, and much like our viewers at home, are looking to have answers to is in terms of the said amendments Chief Ibori was pointing to when he says that the Constitution still provides for joint accounts which might not allow for the functionality of this judgment. Well, um, Section 162 sub 1 of the Constitution clearly states that there shall be a joint account. Uh, the Constitution is a document that actually contradicts itself. That's why I, would, I, I, I recommend, uh, just like other civil society organizations will do, uh, that look, we don't need to amend the Constitution. We need a brand new Constitution. We have amended it over time. It's like um, an old cloot with several areas that have, that have gone bad that um, have been patched over time with new clothes, new pieces of clothes. So you spoil the old clothes and destroy the new one. So what we need to do is have a brand new constitution where we could sit down together at a conference and say, fine, uh, in terms of local government accounts, uh, Section 7 talks about giving direct monies to local government. But Section 162 sub 1 says something very different that there, there must be a joint account but what is the essence of that joint account so we need to in the interim possibly amend the constitution to reflect that but in the ultimate end we need a brand new constitution, constitution. we're tired of this old constitution it's not even a talk to talk autonomous it's not the people's constitution but they lied in section one sub one that we the people were it was not we the people Nigerians never met together. It was just um, Decree 23 of 1999 uh, that decreed the Constitution into existence. I think Decree 23 or 24 decreed the Constitution into existence to claim that they are giving to us a Constitution that will become the, um, the grand norm of the country, that without it, the country cannot exist. But I think, democratically, we could have changed that where we have, within a space of two years, have the, a brand new constitution to reflect the aspirations of Nigerians. I think we've experimented with this for about 24 years now. Uh, we've experimented with it, and we are dissatisfied with it. Now, let's pick it from that angle of democracy, and I hear you say the word brand new. Mm. More, more people would put it towards the renewed hope in terms of how significant it is from the commendation this morning we hear the president given the Supreme Court. Many had said, you know, the three arms of government need their separations of power to bet the Nigeria we hope for. Now, whilst this administration has pushed it further in ensuring that there is a judgment to begin to start the conversation, mm. particularly is this renewed hope in terms of the brand new hope for a new constitution that will capture we the people of Nigeria in terms of our aspirations? Well, I don't want to sound politically correct because I've never liked being politically correct. It could lead to a lot of compromise, subjudice, and sabotage. But I would want to very sincerely commend the president of Nigeria for pushing for this. Uh, president Muhammad Wari tried uh, when he brought out decree. I mean, uh, I keep referring, keep associating decrees with uh, Muhammad Wari. Um, when he brought out Executive Order 9, Executive Order 10, to say that, look, there must be some degree of, uh, some latitude of freedom, of autonomy. And then the people fought it. Even the House of Assembly is not free, the local governments are not free, the legislative harm, I mean the judicial harm, is not free. The courts still go, the chief judge 
of a state still goes to the state governor Capriham begging for money. A lot of courts don't have we don't have we don't have uh, judges appointed, we don't have uh, facilities in the courts and uh, judges are not well taken care of. But if they had their money directly, they could have done that because it's their thing. The local government should have uh, its monies directly so that it could also get things done. But uh, not sounding politically correct does not mean that the, um, the mantra, renewed hope, has not come to play. That is what we are seeing. There, is, there was hope that that hope has been renewed. And so we commend Mr. President for this. Of course, it's his job. If he doesn't do it, I'm not the one to do it. He's the one to do it, to push for it. So he's gotten the Supreme Court to give that judgment. Or rather, he took the matter to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has given the judgment. And that judgment itself has become a law. Because that's where uh, it cannot be challenged beyond here. You can't get the court of the yes, land. Exactly. The court. Any decision given by the apex court of the land becomes a, a, a law on its own. So uh, whether uh, it was provided for or not, but the judgment has been given. But uh, tying it with what James Bowie said, uh, section 162 sub 1, uh, we will need to still think out the constitution to reflect it. But I give a caveat here. And the caveat is that um, all local government, all states operating uh, in this interim arrangement uh, in local government councils must not be given. Having must, they, must not, they must not be giving local government funds again. Mm. So in this next allocation, seize all the monies, keep it in escrow for when uh, an elected local government comes into place. Because Section Seven says that uh, this monies should be there shall be it is guaranteed by the cons in the constitution that they must be elected. Underscore it. Democratically elected local government uh, councils, which of course should superintend over the disbursement of funds, the uh, allocation of revenues, and the implementation of projects. Now, according to the Nigerian uh, Union of Local Government Employees, that's no okay, uh, they've said that um, this judgment is actually solving 50% of the Nigerian problem. What if, if you, what is your understanding of um, this uh, statement and how does it affect us? Well, now there are local government employees and they have grown under the burden of, of the overbearing influence of state government in the joint account. The joint account thing um, has not given them the latitude to operate freely. When I say operate freely, I mean uh, conception of ideas, implementation of those ideas, monitoring them and giving evaluation, monitoring and evaluation. They have not been given that latitude, that grace to do it. So for them to say this, they wear the shoe, they know wear pinches. I agree with them totally, even though the full purport of what they have said may not be in the open, but I think with time. Uh, the full purport will come out. Now, let's look at um, the place of elections and how um, accountability can thrive. Now, we know that even some of the states that have um, that that carry out local government elections, the elections has always been as though it's the governor of the state choosing the local government chairman. Mm. In the sense that we see that the the same party, the same ruling party, just claims all the seats, and whatever opposition party says really doesn't count. So how does this now? How does this judgment? Uh, would it have any effect on elections in states? Yes, I I want to posit that, but it's going to take time. Mm. The culture has been a culture of um, having a strong man against strong institutions. We've not had strong institutions. I think the president is trying to make institutions strong right now. They are not no longer looking at the African philosophy of communalism. In communalism, what you do is have a strong man who actually superintends over the community and gives out handouts, gives out uh, small things to the community without thinking of how to replenish them. And the best way to replenish them is to steal, is to promote corruption. Now, bringing that to local government uh, and the law, vis-a-vis -vis the, the new uh, the judgment, this judgment will put fear in whoever superintends over local government that 
you collect 400 million naira, for instance, and the state governor puts his hand to collect 100, 100 million naira from you guys, you will account for it. They will not hold the state government responsible or the governor responsible. You are the one to account for it. And that way you will be able to tell the governor, please, how do I account for it? You ask him. And the governor could give you whatever strategies he wants you to use in accounting for it. But at the end of the day, everything rises and falls on the leadership of the local government, not of the states. Because you sign to collect it, not the governor. The days of joint account, the state governor will sign. They and the accountant general on behalf of the state governor. But now it is the state, uh, the local government. Now, how does this reflect on the elections? Agree, before now, the fear of losing structure, the fear of losing control of local governments had made state governors to appoint by way of election. They claim they have elected. So, in a state that has like uh, 26 local government councils, if the um, uh, state governor is from party A, he ensures that party A wins all so that he could have direct control because if party B wins anyone, he will not want the person in that local government will not want the state governor from party A to put news into what he's doing. So that's why the, the, the governor from party A may want to uh, institute a process to impeach him or remove him or create crisis in that local government so that he claims he has taken over the local government. Now, um, other parties will see election as a competitive team. They will go out, fight to see how to wrest powers of party A. And party B, C, D, E, F, up to G, up to Z, would want to take power and show. Look at what's happening in Abia State. The Abia State governor came in under a Labour Party and he's been trying to do something different. So once you come from a different party, you want to do something different to show the whole world that yes, my party knows what he's doing and we can do better if you give us the state. So it's, it's, it's a salesman strategy. I have tasted this and we have shown you what we can do. So local government elections will become more competitive, more transparent. But the people the people in those local territories, those localities, they also owe about 80% of the, of, of the, the emergence of who they want. Because now the strongman phenomenon has been broken. The strongman phenomenon where you say, I am the party, I am the leader of the state, I am the this, I am the that. At the end of the day, you cannot really control people again. But once the people insist on the full essence of elections, which is popular participation, you must participate. It must be transparent. Participatory, transparency, and it must be account people must be accountable. In Nigeria, they do things without consequence. That's why we can do things and walk away. And it feels as though there's no consequence. No. So now there are the, the what, what that judgment has done is to introduce consequence. Now you carry you steal government money. I don't know whether the FCC will have the capacity to actually police seven hundred and seventy four local government councils. Local government councils. These, these are some ethical issues mm. that have come up because corruption has been so exposed that it is so widespread and it is a part of uh, culture as it were. Yesterday you heard the former minister who feigned he collapsed in the court. So that's how they've been collapsing. And when they were spending, they weren't collapsing. So this will apply to the local government councils. Seven hundred and in fact seven hundred and seventy four times about eleven or twelve councillors plus chairmen. So you can imagine those they will be running after. Forget in fact they are running after people in the corporate world. They are running after people in government, federal, state. state level. Now they are descending to local government. We they have the capacity. Uh, big questions this morning asked by Barrister Clifford Thomas. As we discuss the broad subject of local government autonomy in light of the Supreme Court's judgment, let's also look at subject two in terms of our line of this morning with the national debate as it grits this decision is captured on the Daily Independent alongside other papers is the fact that there are now mixed reactions in this regard. Mm. Earlier on in your 
earlier statements you made mention of a socio-economic ideology of communalism mm -hmm. now this judgment according to some sections of this debaters are saying it challenges the principle of true federalism now juxtaposing these two ideas is there any contravention in how nigeria practices its federalism in light of this new arrangement nigeria has never practiced federalism we are practicing a unitary system of government where everything is centered in is, is concentrated in the center a true federalism, a true federal state, operates more with independent or semi-dependent component parts. Those component parts are working in synergy to make the entire whole strong. And when um, some people argue that it challenges uh, federalism, I, I will say no. Federalism means that the federal government is working, the state government is working, the local government is working. And their roles are as constitutionally delineated that the federal government does this you go to chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6 uh, and chapter 7 of the constitution and the entire government of the constitution you notice that rules are designated what is the rule of the federal government of the federal executive federal legislature, federal um, judiciary, what's the rule of the state governor state government, executive uh, exec executive uh, legislature uh, uh, legislative arm uh, and the judicial arm. But uh, even though it's also provided for in the schedule of the constitution that local government councils will be responsible for this for, for, for certain things, you notice that by in operation, natural operation, the state government has fused the functions of local government to that of the state. But the federal government is not, has not fused um, uh, the functions of state government with that of the federal government. The federal government has been truly federal, but um, to the extent of allowing the component parts to live and breathe. The new uh, renewed hope agenda said, let the poor breathe. So the institutions need to breathe. So we need to redefine rules and ensure that um, each component of government has its role. Uh, they, you, where you where they say federal government, federal government is not an absolute independence of all of all the component parts. No, it's not an absolute independence. It means there must there must be synergy. They work together, and in working together, it means that there's a symbiotic relationship between federal, the federal, the state, and the local government. And there's a, uh, also a symbiotic relationship. Let me give you one clear. Um, Unclear example. Do you know that even the courts can make laws? This is one example. Once it can't, it can't be appealed, and it stands. It enters a law report and our statute books. It becomes a law. So every other socio-economic and cultural milieu oscillates around it. You must take your lead from it. You cannot go and operate outside the judgment of this this judgment of the constitution you do it it's a criminal act it's contemptuous you can go to prison and that brings us to the point where we're saying that the federal government must stop giving monies to all states that are operating uh what do they call that criminal uh, the um the joint the joint Get account no, no, not even joint account the local government that are not elected the non yes, yes, they should not that is what the judgment has said but I, I hope people will see it the judgment presupposes that it is only democratically elected government local government that should receive, can, that should receive money now, now let's look at let's delve into seraph's um, court hold on before we get into seraph's court we have an interesting <laughs> guest also joining us a former lawmaker one who would also look at it from the angle of the autonomy that should accrue to all the arms of governments beyond the federal the legislative and the judiciary if all of them have these said autonomies then indeed the third tier of government should also have his we'll take a short break and memory turn honorable clayton zobun joins the show ahead of serap's one week ultimatum requesting a refund of 40 trillion naira disbursed to 36 state governors and the fct minister <laughs> stay with us press it's quite an interesting morning having created a background to the legal perspectives 
behind the Supreme Court's judgment on local government autonomy. Now, the conversation broadens further, and you're invited to join it as well through objectivity in joining our discourse. You can lend your thoughts and comments on our online platforms on Facebook, Instagram, and on X at ADBN underscore TV. Now, joining our panel of discussants in the studio this morning is Honorable Clayton Zobon. Good morning to you, Honorable. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me once again to advocate for the advocates. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Let's uh, pick up uh, these two papers just to take our news <coughs> public along as well. On the Punch newspaper and on the Daily News Hub, a call from some civil society organizations demanding accountability as regards local government funds. The Punch newspaper has the lead story, Local Government Funds, FG Floors Governors, as Supreme Court outlaws, caretaker, caretaker exco joint accounts, preventing democratically elected administration in local government unconstitutional, says Supreme Court. President Tinibu, NLC, Norgay, others hail judgment. Ex Ogun, local government chair, Lords President Tinibu. Now, on the Daily News Hub, the catchphrase is Supreme Court judgment. Now, this is where it gets interesting. It says 36 governors, we K, must return 40 trillion naira local government funds, says Serap. Comply within seven days or risk. Legal Action Group warns 50% of Nigeria's problems solved by judgment, says Norgay. Apex Court verdict has restored hope in democracy, says the Nigeria Labour Congress. Now, now, let's get your thoughts quickly as you join the conversation, Honorable Laboon. Uh, much like Barrister Clifford had highlighted, this is quite a turnaround in our democratic landmark. But, but the challenges in the ability for refunds. While Serap is leading the call for a refund of 40 trillion, naira, trillion naira. do you think the state and the FCT uh, might comply in seven days? No, it's not about complying in seven days. Uh, the late Jennifer Ume had made the point that most of the times, like you find that in our country, some of the issues raised, the sociological and social issues, socioeconomic issues, are not justiceable. And that is what we are trying to amend the mm -hmm. constitution to make justiceable. Mm -hmm. So you don't just say that there must be equity. What is the punishment for not complying with the federal character uh, uh, clause in our constitution? What is the punishment for not making or discriminating against somebody who is dis who is suffering a uh, physical disability? What there is no such punishment. But you just say they should be included. They should be included. What well, if they don't get included? You say if somebody steals, if you defile a child, if really you should get this terms of imprisonment, what is the problem for not for lack of inclusivity in an organization, in an appointment in a state? So in this particular instance, what Serap is calling for is attention to the fact that this has to stop. It is not necessarily about the reforms. If states are going to uh, pensions, can promote people without uh, uh, financial benefit, and people have retired without gratuities for four or five years in some states, what are you talking about, 400? 40 trillion. 40 trillion. 40 trillion. It's not, uh, there's no chicken change. Now, you cannot get that. What they are demanding, and which is right, which is what I expect civil societies to engage government about in terms of accountability, is to ensure that this works. For instance, it took the federal government itself to go to the Supreme Court to ask for the autonomy when even state assemblies. On three occasions, I remember clearly. In fact, in the last one, it was more dramatic that they got the 2040 they required. What the last state was not asked to withdraw its concurrence, and because of that, the amendment couldn't go through. This same autonomy, both for the House assemblies and for the local government, states will not allow that to happen, even by state legislators who ought to be the gatekeepers for the people they represent. They couldn't do it. So, this step by the federal government and by this president, especially, should be very highly commended. This government, especially led by Ashwadu, remember that he was one of the first victims of local government autonomy and restructuring. Restructuring is not just about giving us autonomy in the regions and states. It is also about governance obeying even the constitution, simple rules of the constitution, autonomy. Section 7 sub 1, a system of democratically elected local government system is hereby established. First sentence, constitutional, yet people have brazenly violated that section and nobody has talked and there were no consequences. One of the consequences is stop giving allocation to that, that, that tier of government. 
if it is no longer part of one of the tiers of government, why do you fund it from the first child of the consular revenue of the federation? Why do you do that? Now, now let's look at this comment coming in from President Bola Metinibu. Much as Nigerians are commending his administration for initiating this decision, he says, and I quote, this country belongs to all of us. By virtue of this judgment, our people, especially the poor, will be able to hold their local leaders to account for their actions and inactions. What is sent to local government accounts will be known, and services must now be provided for without excuses." Unquote. Now, similarly, you find another company in infographics. Many are beginning to hail President Bola Metinibu as a restructuring general. But I, I would like to come to Barrister Clifford Thomas at this time and find out. He has lauded Serap for highlighting this issue and bringing it to mm -hmm. prominence. Mm -hmm. He's also advocating that there be stipulated provisions in our constitution, spelling out the punishments in terms of when there are defaulters in this stead. Uh, what are some of those possible punishments to deter local leaders, much like the president hopes, from misusing or misappropriating these funds? Well, before we go to um, looking at the uh, or the expected and expected um, punishment, we should even look at those who defaulted. The provisions are there in the constitution since 1999 that it is only democratically elected administration that our local government administration that should receive funds. In fact, it is guaranteed. Once the constitution says it is guaranteed, it means it's so sacrosanct you can't shift it. So how many persons and who are those the, who are being in default of this? All the state governors, almost all previous state governors, must be brought to account. They must say something in the court as to why they did what they did. That's why the step that Sarah has taken is very commendable. And uh, when I say Sarah has been going to court without getting judgment, no, no, no. Sarah has its strategies is to make the civil society, which is me and you and this general society, to become consciousness of the harm, of the wrong that has been done. And to what extent, if you calculate it by the socioeconomic index of, of damages, you'll be shocked that it goes beyond um, 500 trillion naira, not just 40 trillion naira. Because the consequences of the lack of provision of amenities, the consequences of stealing monies meant for local government, local amenities, the consequences of not engaging the people at the local level by appointing your surrogates to lead the local government is in excess of 500 trillion naira. But if Serap is looking at the direct physical cash of approximately 40 trillion naira, they are not wrong. Now, some of the punishment will be this. We are, I am one of those, amongst others, who are advocating that if you are convicted for any form of corruption, you should be executed. Or you should be given the kind of punishment that makes prison sentence so unbearable that you wish for death. Much like they have in Asian countries. Yes. 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 In fact, there's a prison I saw in Russia uh, two days ago. Where they, in fact, Russia right now does not give the death sentence because they feel it's an easy way out for the corporate. <laughs> So what they do is put you in a prison where you will suffer every day with terrible hard labor so that by the time you su survive 25 years in that prison, they will free you. But nobody has survived up to, up to 15 years in that prison. So they make life for corruption, yes. And why, how did we get here? By corruption. So the state governments must, one punishment will be sentence somebody to 25 years in prison and make that sentence come with hard labor. And I bet you, so many members of the House of, of, the House of Reps, of the Senate, and of the College of Governors will go through this. Uh, we have very few, few pious ones. Now, seize and confiscate their assets. Combat it not to federal government assets, but to the people's assets. If somebody stole so much from Kogi State, for instance, and was able to seize local government monies for, from Kogi State, for instance, convert the assets with approaches of corruption, 
convert it to the asset of the people of Kogi State. Let the people decide what they want to do with it. If they want to give police to use as any facility, they can. But let them let the, the properties, the assets begin to generate money for the people. Now, now this decision number to three. invest. To, hold on, before you go, we'll come back to number three. Please hold your thoughts. This decision to use the money would vest with the state house of assembly, right? Of course, appropriation is a, a, a mm. function of the state assembly. So, so if it's going to be with the state assembly, is it really the, the, the domestication of the law? Mm. There must be an, a bill, an act. In the case of a state, a law, a state law mm -hmm. dealing with appropriation. In fact, subsection two and three of section seven of the Nigerian Constitution deals with who should do what. In fact, subsection two says that the the the, the law for the uh, uh, implementation of of the finance administration and structure of local government is vested in the state house of assembly subsection two of section seven of the constitution we'll that means three in a bit okay, yes mm -hmm. that means clearly that you are having to go back to the assembly to do that in fact if you look at our crossover law which was by the grace of god under my chairmanship what we did there was to ensure that even the accounting officers for local government auditors accountants uh, the, uh, all those people have a particular qualification and there is punishment for any, any of those officers, director of work, director of finance, there is punishment for them if you get at any time, for example, you do contract splitting, because that's where it takes place, and all sorts of things. So if, for example, this law is enacted to do what he has just suggested, what that means is that it becomes punishable under the state law for you not to use that money for that purpose. Now, now let's come back to point three. I just needed for us to buttress it, because owing to the experience and what he said in Cross River, it's tenable and if implemented in a way that the state house of assembly ensures that it's followed to the latter i'm sure the people would have more confidence in agreeing with point two as you raised mm. so let's get back now to before point. i get to point three let me also reflect uh on what he has said he did a great job they did a great job in cross river state but section one sub three of the constitution of the federal republic of nigeria says any law any law rules regulation including state laws any law that contradicts the spirit, the aspiration of this constitution, so I remain to the extent of its um, constituency, uh, the supremacy of the yes, constitution. the supremacy. We talk of the supremacy of the constitution that it will mean null and void in unity. Now, the state might have a good intention, but where some people from the state feel, oh, it's going to affect them, and from some other states feel, if their state adopt this same thing across the bad day, it's going to affect them negatively. They might go through the federal government to frustrate it. That's another huge concern. They might go through the federal government to frustrate it. Despite the fact that the House of Assembly carries the conscience of the people. But that uh, that statement, again, is challengeable. Because some state House of Assembly, uh, particularly their members, they are detached. So detached from the people. In Crossover, for instance, all of them want to live in Calabar, in the federal capital, in the state capital. They don't want to go back to their constituency. But it's, some persons might hold a different view. But that is what we know about almost all the states. We practice around the country. We know about almost all the states of the Federation. They want to congregate in the state capital where there are amenities. They have everything they need. But in their constituencies, how often do they even go constituency briefing? So let me go to point three. Point three is ensure that all their relatives, particularly they themselves, their wives, their children, that they cannot travel outside the country. They'll say, yeah, that freedom of movement is guaranteed, but there is a limitation to the rights guaranteed by the Constitution. There are limitations to them, particularly when you have committed an offense against the state. And this is an offense against the state. Not releasing local government funds to democratically elected local governments um, officials or councils becomes a criminal offense. Now, I think we are gradually getting to the stage where it will not just be a civil offense. It will become a criminal offense. And once it becomes a criminal offense, punishments are prescribed. Or where punishments are prescribed or described to fit in as punishment, anything described to fit in as punishment, it becomes a criminal offense. And once it is criminalized, it means somebody will have to suffer consequences. And one of the consequences will be 
stop them from crying and say if they have in fact there should be a rule if not a law that once you are appointed into government office whether elected or appointed you must withdraw all your children who are studying outside the country. Who we'll come to that? <laughs> you, know, you must withdraw your children in private schools. Mm. Take up a public school and supervise so that the quality and of education is good. And improve. Now, now, Honorable Obun, it's also from the point of executive orders. Some state governors have gone a step further in trying to ensure accountability on the part of local government chairmen and their councils in mandating them to be residents in their local government areas. But this executive order seems to be somewhat flouted by local government chairmen and councils, much like uh, Barrister Clifford said. <laughs> because, again, there is no punishment for it. One of the conditions should be, when we talk about, when we are doing the, we are talking about the clash between state laws and regulations against the Constitution. For you to enact a law in the state, you must first of all consult the Constitution to ensure that you are not in any way going to because any law or regulation even an act of the national assembly that clashes with the constitution it must bow and mm -hmm. give way so it is not just about states it is that even the national assembly can make remember the uh, anti-corruption law in Kano, where they were inviting candidates to come in there mm -hmm. and they said look look at what the constitution says about investigation cpc this is so there are a lot of confusion but we expect that the supreme court will give us a clear interpretation of something that you can't enact this uh, if it clashes if you are doing it and it doesn't clash with the constitution there's no problem about that but in this context what we are discussing here is that if you make an executive order which does not clash with any state law an order is any other can must not also clash even with an existing state law mm. when we talk about the constitution mm. once it clashes to a substantive law that executive order is a nullity. Now, in the context in which we are dealing with it, which is what the federal government tried to implement when they said, look, if you don't have an election, we will we'll send a location. Under which law are you doing that? That's why they needed the interpretation of the Supreme Court. To say, a man is infringing on the Constitution. For instance, you have given a governor immunity, and you watch him come see his opponent on the street, pull a gun and shoot him. He says he's covered by immunity. Should it be criminal immunity or civil immunity? Mm. This is what our culture ought to deal with. Mm. We also have the clash in which the number one law officer of the public, the attorney general, and then the minister are combined into one office, making it difficult for him to know where his allegiance and loyalty lie. Is it to the people or to the government he's serving as minister? That is why those two offices have to be separated. I agree with the lawyers who say so. I'm not a lawyer. So I will not be able to know the details, but my conscience and my reading and my study do not permit me to accept that one man can be quoted mm -hmm. with the gap of a priest yes. and the gap of a lay, a lay, a lay member. Mm -hmm. So you cannot have that. The more you one person wearing the cassock and the sultan, you can't wear both. Now this subject of autonomy, bordering on whatever arm of government or whatever theory of government, has some of these concerns as rightly raised by Honorable Cletus Obun. In moving forward, uh, how does the Supreme Court and the CJN look to clear this lacuna as you talked about a new constitution in its entirety? Mm -hmm. Would this be the perfect way to solve these challenges? Uh, there's no perfection in a world of imperfect human beings and institutions. I align myself on all fours with what Honorable uh, Clayton Zubun said. Uh, the Office of Attorney General must be distinguished from the Office of uh, the Attorney General and the, the Minister. The Minister The minister is a member of government. The Attorney General is strictly for the people. So when you fuse them together, and I like his uh, analogy that uh, you can't wear the cassock and still be part of the lady. And uh, I, I agree perfectly the with that. The priest cannot become no, a parishioner. You cannot. <laughs> you cannot. You can, you can. You may be the head of the parish or the parish priest. But you cannot be a just an ordinary member Number. of the parish. So one should represent the people. Uh, we, that's why you have the office of the public defender, and the other one should represent government. So um, uh, the question again: How do we solve it? Is it the con a new constitution okay, without okay, okay, amending okay. an amended one? Uh, well, we've amended this. Uh, this our constitution is so patched and over patched. And uh, the OBMAs in the National Assembly, they, <laughs> they, they have overpatched 
this concern that it is so I wanted to use the word useless, but um, not in Nigeria is useless. I would rather use the word they have made it so ineffective that it contradicts each other. This section contradicts this section. For instance, section 7 of the Constitution, sub 1, actually contradicts section 162 of the Constitution. So how do you reconcile that? That's where the Supreme Court comes in. Once the Supreme Court says, this is our thinking, and our interpretation about this section of the Constitution, it so holds. Because which court will you want to take it to? To court of appeal? Or where? You can't take it to anywhere. Because the it, it, apex court is the Supreme court. court. It has ruled. And once it ruled, it becomes a law. And once it becomes a law, it is followed. It must be obeyed. It must be followed. So we actually need in the ultimate, in the long run, a brand new constitution. constitution. But that may not take place so soon. But I, I understand that they are working on something that may come out before 1st October or by 1st October. If they do it, fine, but they must include Nigerians. We, the people, we, the people, includes the market women in the market, includes the uh, shoe on the streets, includes the pure water seller. We, the people, is not just uh, vesting everything in the House of Assembly, for instance, or the National Assembly, but how congenial is the relationship between the National Assembly, the House of Assembly, and the people, so, so that we can say, we, the people. people. At what point are the people consulted? At what point do the people feel included in what is happening? At what point can the people say, oh no, we oppose this because 20 years ago, when we tried operating this, it was not operational. It detached itself from the people. At what point can we create a synergy? So, um, uh, amending it in the interim may be like doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different, different result, result, which is called madness, but giving us a brand new constitution will suffice.